All right. I'd like us to begin just with one scripture in the book of 2 Timothy, very familiar to all of us, uh, very challenging to many of us. It says in verse 5 of 2 Timothy 4, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. And one of the things that I like to do with these uh, sessions is to speak about men who did the work of an evangelist. I like to do that because it's a challenge to my own soul. It's an encouragement, uh, but uh, it's also uh, a convicting thing to listen to how God used these different men. And tonight, I want to think of a man called Charles Stanley. Now, when you think of the name Charles Stanley, you normally think uh, of uh, this uh, famous uh, preacher from Atlanta, Georgia, um, and uh, his radio ministry and all the rest of it. But that's not who I have in mind at all. Uh, just happens to share the same name. But this is a, a man from the United Kingdom uh, called Charles Stanley of Rotherham. And Rotherham is a place about 32 miles or 51 kilometers from where I was born uh, in Yorkshire in England. And uh, Charles Stanley didn't have the ideal beginning in life. In fact, he was orphaned at four years of age, and he had to earn his living in the summer months. He was able to go to school. Uh, he was uh, cared for by a guardian, but in order to, uh, as it were, uh, earn his keep, uh, he had to spend all summer working in the, in the fields. But he had a great energy, and he had great potential to be a rascal. Uh, uh, he, he had a kind of a great sense of humor and uh, lots of energy. And in fact, his legal guardian uh, was a bit concerned about, about young Charles. And one day he said to him, he said, Charles, you will either be a curse or a blessing to mankind. <laughs> I thought that was interesting uh, for somebody to say that to someone. You're either going to be a blessing or a curse to mankind. And again, the potential in every human being is there to either be a blessing or to be a curse to mankind. And by the mercies of God... Uh, Charles Stanley became a blessing to thousands, and uh, he was converted at the age of 14. And actually, the year of his conversion, he preached his first message. Now, imagine this, a 14-year-old. Uh, but one Sunday, the preacher who was assigned uh, in the little chapel that he was attending did not show up. And so Charles uh, Stanley got up, and he opened his Bible to John 3, 16, and preached his first gospel message at 14 years of age. And he was uh, certainly a very quick-witted youth and uh, was certainly somebody that God had really set apart to do the work of an evangelist. And he was one who, uh, Scripture talks in 2 Corinthians 8, 18, of somebody who's anonymous, but whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And I would suggest that that would be true of Charles Stanley. At the age of 23, uh, with meager capital, he had begun his own hardware business. And he really was a tent maker for the bulk of his life. That's what he did. He uh, sold uh, hardware. Uh, he was his own kind of representative for the company. And so <clears throat> he would travel around selling his wares and at the same time, use the opportunity to preach the gospel. He came across uh, one of the many aristocrats that had come to know Christ in the early Brethren movement, uh, a man called Captain Wellesley. Uh, Captain Wellesley had some uh, very famous uh, relatives. In fact, um, he was the nephew of the Iron Duke, the Duke of Wellington, famous for his uh, military campaigns, including the Battle of Waterloo and all the rest of it. So, And also, by the way, uh, connected to the Wesley family as well, uh, because uh, the same uh, Duke of Wellington had connections with the, the Wesleys too. But anyway, under the gracious teaching of Captain Wellesley, uh, the, the Bible became a new book to Charles Stanley. And uh, he, his daily study, he, he began to really grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And again, just this, the influence of this godly man upon him and his ministry really had a big impact uh, on Charles Stanley. As he crisscrossed England while doing the work of an evangelist and selling his wares, uh, he said 
and this is one of the things I want to bring to our attention tonight. He said, seldom in those days. Now, again, he lived from 1821 to 1890. So that gives us the time frame, 1821 to 1890. He says, seldom in those days did the Lord open my lips without some soul being converted. He said, not that this appeared at the time, but I have met them everywhere. 10, 20, 30 years after, people that were converted at certain places where he preached. He might not have known that day, but years later, he found out that that was the case. His favorite Old Testament story was a well-known story to all of us, the story of Mephibosheth, the orphan who was tragically crippled. And of course, Stanley, being an orphan himself, really related to this story, but he said, speaking of his message on Mephibosheth, he remarked, I believe the Lord rarely ever led me to preach from Mephibosheth without souls being converted. It was one of those messages. Every time he preached it, somebody got saved. Dale Moody, late in later years, told Stanley that he had preached Stanley's sermon. He had actually stolen his message because it was published on Mephibosheth, and he had preached it in every city in America, and he thought never without souls being brought to God. <laughs> so not only did this message do Charles Stanley, but it was Dale Moody. Uh, maybe, uh, Bob, you should speak on Mephibosheth tomorrow. You're wondering what you should speak on. Maybe <laughs> maybe that's what we should be speaking on. I don't know. But um, one of the things about him is that uh, that stands out to me as I think of Charles Stanley he expected the Lord's special and direct guidance. And you read his story, and of course, this is where you'll find his story. It's a, a, a kind of booklet called Incidents of Gospel Work that details, uh, the, the subtitle is How the Lord Led Me, uh, amazing little book. Uh, but he, he expected the Lord's special and direct guidance, and he pitied the Christian who did not enjoy looking to the Lord every day for directives from the Holy Spirit. Now, this is before the Pentecostal movement. And here's a man who knows directly the leading of the Spirit, just like the book of Acts. You know, the Lord, for, the Spirit forbade them to go here. And, and the Lord closed the door, Spirit closed the door here. This kind of guidance, it seems, was very real. Although when we read it, and if you read this, you, at times you'll think, it seems a bit mystical, a bit subjective at times, uh, but his own record abounds with, with deep impressions from the spirit that he needs to go to preach in a certain place. And that's exactly what he did. He obeyed these promptings and all was with blessings. For instance, and I'm going to give you some examples of such promptings that he was given and how the Lord worked. So he says this, three of us felt led to go to Leamington. Now, often in English words, that's how it reads, but it's actually Leamington, Leamington Spa. But anyway, uh, who had, uh, we had small notices printed asking the Christians of Leamington to come together to the music hall at three o'clock for prayer for the Lord's blessing on the word to be preached in the hall that night. So they booked the music hall, they called Christians, uh, just put it on little, they actually put it on envelopes and stuck it around the place. Uh, and they said, come at three o'clock for prayer. And then there'll be gospel preaching in the hall that night. Well, <clears throat> he says, about 200 came together to pray. <laughs> oh, what a cry of united, expecting prayer went up to the throne of grace. At seven, the large hall was filled. That night, God answered prayer. It was the birth night of many precious souls. It was said some hundreds found deliverance and blessing that night. But he preached everywhere, by the riverside, in railroad cars, on steamboats, at balls, at, at race courses, uh, in halls, in chapels, in kitchens, in drawing rooms in theaters, in concert halls. Uh, Charles Stanley witnessed to the grace of God wherever doors opened. Another occasion, he was leaving Bristol 
where he had been preaching. And he went to a place called Tetbury, which again, about 40 kilometers away, a stranger to that part of the country. He's never been there before. He said on arriving at Wooten Under Edge, that's a quaint name of an English village, Wooten Under Edge, I had some time to spare. It was about five o'clock on a hot day in the midst of harvest. There was scarcely a person to be seen in this little town. I was very distinctly impressed from the Lord that I must preach the gospel there that very afternoon. Yet there appeared to be no people to preach to. Nearly all seemed to be out in the harvest field. Yet the conviction deepened that I must preach. Taking a handful of tracks, he began hunting for a congregation, great or small. He was standing in a little shop speaking to a woman about her soul when from up the road, a man puffing with exertion, perspiration steaming off his face, charged into the shop and said, please, sir, are you a preacher of the gospel? Wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody come up to you and said, hey, sir, are you a preacher of the gospel? Yes, he admitted, I am through the Lord's mercy. But why do you ask? The man who was the town crier or bellman, he was the guy who got everybody's attention in the town, the town crier uh, in the village of Wooten. He says, I was working in the field and a woman came past and told me someone was distributing tracks in Wooten. And it was just as if a voice had said to me, you must run and there must be preaching in Wooten today. So now not only Charles Stanley's convinced there should be preaching in Wooten, so is this town crier. And he, he runs uh, to get it. And that's why I left my work and came immediately. As he was the town crier, Stanley involuntarily put his hand into his pocket to give him a shilling. Oh, dear, no, sir, he said. I don't want the money. I want souls to be saved. In half an hour, he had washed himself, publicly announced the preaching, and they were on their way to the preaching location. Just outside the town, they were passing a house on the right. When, Stanley said, the Spirit of God stopped me and distinctly directed me to stand on the doorstep. And on that end of it, nearest the town, the crowd that gathered was not large. Stanley wondered what the purpose was in preaching from that place. When, after the message, the husband and wife who owned the house opened the door from behind him. They had been standing behind the front door and had heard every word. The man was openly weeping as he told Stanley, we have never heard these things before. Stanley went in and spoke to the man, his wife, and his invalid mother, who had also heard the entire message from an upstairs window. All three trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. A wave of spiritual awakening had reached Scotland. William Trotter had been to Glasgow and saw hundreds of souls coming to Christ. He told Stanley of the wonderful works of God. And then this is Stanley's response. A remarkable sense of the Lord's presence came over me, said Charles Stanley. I felt moved by divine power to go at once to Birmingham. A strength of faith and expectation that souls would be saved, such as I had never before had in my life. It filled me with confidence. A large room in Broad Street was crammed night after night. The after meeting nearly all stayed. The preaching was devoid of emotional string pulling, or psychological manipulation, Stanley did little inviting or pleading with sinners. He spoke almost entirely of the righteousness of God in justifying the sinner and of justification in the risen Christ. Indeed, I have always found, he says, the more God is revealed in Christ in preaching, the more lasting the results. There must also be undoubting confidence in the word of God, that all who are brought by the Holy Spirit to believe God are justified from all things. While these meetings were held in Birmingham, a brother in Christ came over from Stafford. He believed that God was about to bless souls there, 
he returned and asked some brethren to come together to cry to God. At six o'clock the next morning, a number prayed for blessing on the word there at that same night. But when this brother borrowed chairs so that every available seat was crammed into the meeting place that they, the large meeting room that they were, they were hosting this meeting, doubters began to smirk like, we're not going to get that many people, you know, and he's packing it out with chairs. But at 6.45 p.m., the large room was packed. Several were fainting because they were so packed in to the auditorium. The danger from the crush was so great that a gentleman stood up and offered the use of a large church building nearby. Then it also was quickly filled. One drunk man unexpectedly lurched in, and the solemnity of God's presence had him sobered up in a moment. With many others, he professed to be converted that night. Stanley was not interested in tallying numbers. He viewed the results of his gospel preaching with caution. Looking back at very encouraging gospel campaign, he would say, many professed to be saved. Some fell away as on stony ground hearers, but the day will declare what was of the Spirit of God. He was called to his heavenly home from his earthly home in Rotherham on March the 30th of 1890. But he left an imp a, a definite uh, legacy behind. And how that happened is interesting because um, he had many stories of these divine appointments and people that he came to Christ through his ministry. And a brother asked him, why don't you print some of those incidents of the Lord's work uh, in the railway cars and all these other places? I'm sure the Lord would use them. He had never thought of it, but he urged him to do so. How little, he says, did I think at that moment that the Lord would use these tracks. They're called the CS tracks. You can still read them online today, CS tracks. He said the Lord would use them in so many languages. The goal, he said in writing the tracks, is to look to God to give me to write just what he pleased and to enable me to write it plainly without any adornment, to never allow me to write with a party feeling, but to write for the whole church of God or gospel to every sinner in every incident related, to give the exact words as near as I could recollect. His counsel to Christian workers was simply this. I've always found blessing and results in proportion to communion with Christ in his love to the whole church, whether in writing or preaching, and no Christian can prosper in his own soul unless he is seeking the welfare of others. Now, I was thinking about just those little incidents, and again, it's all very fascinating, but I, I was trying to think of specific prayer pointers that we could take away from the life of Charles Stanley of Rotherham. And one of the things I think we should all be praying for is that the church, including ourselves, would know more of the direct guidance of the Spirit of God in leading us to souls and leading us to open fields of labor. That was something that stood out about his ministry. He had these strong compulsions. God wanted him to preach here, wanted him to go there, wanted him to stop here to speak to this soul. And he was just in such communion with the Lord that he was very conscious of divine guidance. Secondly, that we might see days again where rarely is the gospel preached without souls coming to Christ. <laughs> Sadly, we're in days where it seems the gospel is preached, but rarely souls come to Christ. But all oh, part of the revival we're praying for is to experience those kind of days once again. And then thirdly, Lord, would you give us sermons that are greatly blessed of you? Charles Stanley had... Philemon charged that to my account and he said he rarely 
preach that sermon without someone getting saved. Lord, give us sermons that, not that we trust the sermon, we trust you, the living God, but it would be wonderful to have a sermon that resonated with this generation and would speak to their hearts in a very clear way, the gospel message. And then, Lord, deliver us from a narrowness that does not seek blessing on the whole church of God. That seems to be something about his ministry, that although he had his convictions, and he certainly was a man who believed in divine truth concerning how we should meet all the rest of it, but he had a heart for the whole church of God. And then the fifth thing is increase our faith to believe when God is about to do a work. It seemed like several occasions where people just knew the Lord was going to do something. <laughs> the Lord was going to work. And they had that confidence. And wouldn't it be wonderful if in believing prayer, there was a day where we just had that confidence. God is going to do something. So anyway, five practical pointers that were helpful to me as I pondered the life of Charles Stanley of Rotherham. Now there's more information about him online. Um, certainly his book, The uh, Incidents of Gospel Work, you, know, you can get that online on stempublishing.org. Uh, it's all there. All his tracks are on stempublishing.org as well. Chief Men Among the Brethren, there's a biography of him also on stempublishing.org. And then um, also there's a lot about him on the brethrenarchive.org as well. So including pictures and all the rest of it. So that's Charles Stanley of Rotherham. May his um, faithful work of doing the work of an evangelist inspire us, uh, inspire our praying uh, to trust the Lord that he might lead us more directly to souls and give us a word in season for those that are weary. May God encourage us with these thoughts.